everyone, and uh, welcome to Campaign's uh, latest online briefing, Creativity You Can Hear, Audio Storytelling, Targeting, and the Future. I'm Austin Allison, the editor of Campaign Middle East. If you want to know more about Campaign Middle East, you can check us out at campaignme.com. You can listen to our podcast on Anchor Army or wherever you get podcasts. And uh, come to our event. Our next event is physical. It's on out-of-home media, and we're actually holding it out of our home. Uh, it's going to be on the 25th of October at the West in Minasiahi, so watch our website for more details. You can go to our website and register for Marcoms 360 Predictions 2022, which is our annual flagship event, um, and it's also going to be taking place physically, as well as streamed, on uh, November the 11th at 5 the Palm, so do make sure you get your registrations in there early. Um, it's great to see all of you coming in, uh, or at least your names. Um, and thanks for taking the time to join us for what's going to be some pretty good conversations. Uh, thanks, first of all, to our sponsors, who are DMS and Angami. DMS, as I'm sure you're aware, is the uh, digital arm of Schwery Group. Uh, it's distinguished for being the voice of independent publishers in the MENA region. It's represented... Uh, it, rep it's represented. it represents more than 30 Arabic and international websites, video and music streaming platforms, such as Angami. And uh, the team there works hand in hand with brands and independent publishers to deliver tailor-made digital solutions backed by data-driven insights and the latest technology. Angami, I think that's the fourth time I mentioned you guys now, is um, the leading music streaming platform in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, it has a unique library of more than 70 million Arabic and international songs. It provides users with a collection of podcasts, including, very importantly, on the record with Campaign Middle East, and others as well, from all categories, and uh, ready-made playlists curated by a team of music experts. So um, thanks a lot for helping us out, guys. We're going to be looking at all things audio today. In our second panel, I'm going to be joined by a couple of podcast experts to look at how brands can make the most of podcasts as a marketing platform. We're going to be looking at everything from advertising and sponsorship to creating a brand's own podcast. So please do stick around for that. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, the two people I've got on are going to be, well, I know that they really know their onions. Um, our first panel, though, is called Lend Me Your Ears. It's going to look at the creative potential of audio as a storytelling medium. Um, it's going to be, so I'd like to welcome that panel. I won't uh, steal any more of your thunder. Um, I'd like to welcome the moderator, who is Jibran Abdulkalik, who is the Vice President of Commercial at Angami. Um, and uh, Jibran is joined by Ray Saman, who is the Integration Director at, uh, of One Team Stellantis at Publicis Group. Um, he's also joined by Shatsi Gita. Um, who works on Quaker. Uh, she is a senior marketing manager there at PepsiCo International. And Claire Fetcher... Uh, I got almost through the names without <laughs> slipping up. I beg your pardon, Claire. Claire Fletcher Calvert is the head of engagement at the media agency OMD. So without any more ado, I'm going to hand over to you guys. Take it away, Gibran. Thank you, uh, Austin, for, uh, for not messing with my name, at least. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jibran Abdul Kalik. Um, just to introduce myself a bit, uh, I have 14 years of experience in digital advertising, and I currently work at Anrami on their advertising business as VP of Commercial, uh, responsible for our ads, revenue, product marketing, and Anrami Ads Manager. So 2020 was a stunning reminder. I think of the true power of audio. As the pandemic hit, audio in all its forms became a constant companion and a global connector. Audio's share of consumption is rising fast and the opportunities for brands to grow with, the audio, with audio is massive. However, advertising spend is yet to follow. In fact, according to Work's investment gap report, spend on audio would need to increase at least three times to match audience behaviors. And this has been also substantiated by recently the IAB GCC's 2020 MENA digital ad spend report, very long, in terms of ad spend per capita on a local level. Um, 
we're here today to talk about how marketeers can leverage the power of audio, right? As a medium and what that future holds for, ad, for, the audio, for the audio advertising industry as a whole. The beauty of audio is that it delivers the message all while giving your brain enough space to wonder. It unlocks a world of creativity that cannot be seen and delivers business results across the funnels. So today, I'm joined by three leaders in the Middle East market representing different players in the ecosystem. I'm grateful to you all for being here today, and I'm excited to have this discussion that will span across the media landscape. So first, we have Shatsi, who joins us from PepsiCo as part of the consumer engagement team, where she led content creation for MENA, Middle East and APAC, and currently leads the, uh, cur currently leads uh, the marketing for Quaker on Africa, Middle East, and South Asia regions, Amesa. She is also the co-founder of the PepsiCo Content Factory, which is globally recognized PepsiCo capability that changed the social media content game in Amesa. Next up, we have Claire Fletcher, a full service communication specialist who heads the engagement department at OMD with over 10 years of experience in the advertising industry. Claire develops a new, uh, sorry, Claire develops new ways of engaging with brands audiences using empathy and human connection as the focus. Last but not least, we have Ray Samman who has started his career in radio industry and is today a one team Stellantis integration director, which is part of the publicist group with over 10 years of experience across digital content production media and social media with solid education from global digital media and creative agencies. Thank you all today to be here and let's get to our first question. So we're gonna start with something a bit fun. So audio has always accompanied us as human beings throughout our lives um, since the beginning of time, right? So the fact audio is only the second to smell to help you recall the memory. Let's get started with a small game here. So I'm going to play some audio clips for you and Ray, Claire and Shatsi, I'd like to hear some, some uh, how it makes you feel. So how did that make you feel? made me feel like uh, putting on my trainers and going for a run and uh, bolting from this building <laughs> now that the weather's all nice. <laughs> uh, Ray? Yeah, that was very nostalgic. It brought me, brought me back to, to the days when we really saw the marketing stunt that they've done, um, that 24 hours dance uh, on digital. It always sparks that memory, that, that's all. And last but not least. Absolutely, it's super nostalgic. I think this song really transformed the way we looked at flash mobs for a couple of yeah. weeks, I guess. Exactly. Uh, I exactly. mean, in those weeks, it feels like a lifetime, but it was probably a couple of days, but uh, it was all over our feet. Uh, exactly. So yeah, absolutely. So I'm gonna play the second, um, if you want, song, and let's see how that makes you feel. Goodbye, my lover. Goodbye, my friend. You have been the one. Jesus. So, Shatsi? I think this feels like a girlfriend's breakup uh, song over ice cream, right? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. For me, this like sums up COVID. It, it accompanied many <laughs> WhatsApps. <laughs> and James Blunt is just so brilliant on Twitter as well. So making fun of himself was great an accompaniment. <laughs> Again, so many unforgiving memories of uh, the teen years, which I don't want to dwell on a lot. <laughs> All right. So, so if you can see that in less than a minute, how we managed to feel two different emotions, literally through two six second song bites that we had. So now let's try this. So what do you remember when you listen to this? This for me is 
full on childhood. Like we used to head to the beach as a family and this always just reminded me of salt, sea, family, happiness, break. Um, yeah, this takes me back. Nicely put. Uh, Ray? Um, uh, there's a twisted uh, uh, thought into this because uh, now I use that a lot into my uh, mixing and mastering skills on, in music. It moved from that beachy lifestyle stuff into white noise and mixing that into the audio settings that I absolutely. do a lot. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, to be honest, it's my, my meditation. I mean, I use a collection of meditation apps uh, at night to just calm down and most of them kind of use that sound so this has blended into meditation and white noise uh, applications and i guess that's what it is for me now and and it's on our playlist right now to keep the baby very quiet in the car which is <laughs> white noise i can, i know what you're talking about yeah <laughs> so uh so what two more clips and i just want to see what you think about these they're, they're the more fun ones if you want so let's hear them Now this is my childhood. Exactly. Don't away how old I am, but this is absolutely my Game Boy. I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. It's like the OG of gaming, right? <laughs> what started it all, honestly, man? I mean, probably people listening on this webcast are going, "What the hell?" Who are, are these? Who are these people? Who Enjoy are the these people? <laughs> so for the last one, uh, just quickly. Yeah, definitely has a popcorn taste. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. This is calories in, this is calorie per second, right? Exactly. <laughs> and I think uh, just to conclude here uh, on the first question, um, so with these two last audio bites that we, that we played, it just makes, these are recognizable brands, right? And um, I think, I think with, with these recognizable sounds, no one doesn't know them because they've been, not only played throughout childhood, right? But these are also so. For example, the twentieth century, twentieth century Fox has been around for I don't know how many decades, and it still is super. Um, you know it uh, very well. So let's get into the things now, right? So obviously, radio has been a traditional audio channel, which has highlighted the power of audio, and then music streaming paved the way to digital audio. So the question here is, as marketeers, when did you start implementing audio as part of your marketing channels and how? Uh, Shatsi, would you like to take this? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I, I think it's, it's inevitable to start saying that audio is some of the oldest forms of storytelling and in general. So I think people started off telling stories and telling tales around campfires, regardless where the campfire is, uh, whether it's in a forest or in the desert reciting poetry, but telling stories through through words is the first form of storytelling, I think in, in a, a couple of cultures, but also in a couple of ancient uh, civilizations. So absolutely, it is one of the very first ones. It's also, as you said, radio is, probably the channel with the, with the most longevity we know in modern history, right? So, I mean, we've seen print come and go, we've seen TV come and stay for a while, we've seen digital, but I think I always feel radio is always going to be a cold, uh, a steam. We'll never, there'll always be oil, there'll always be solar panels, but there's also always going to be coal. So radios kind of, and it's when optimized correctly is amazing. Um, but absolutely, audio uh, apps have taken that notion and repurposed it for the 21st century. But back to your question, how did we as marketeers, I'll talk as PepsiCo, so how did we at PepsiCo, spe specifically the digital transformation and consumer engagement team, uh, start our audio storytelling journey? Well, I think 
we kind of have a very simple equation, uh, putting it very lightly. We have a very simple equation. Where are, are our consumers? What mindset are they in in that moment? So before we're marketeers, we look at our budgets, the channels, the connection mapping. There is a consumer who is the same consumer that's on a couple of video uh, platforms, but they're also on an audio uh, platform. So what's the mindset they're in? So first consumer, first most consumer, what's the mindset they're in? They're coming for entertainment and they're coming to stay, which is amazing because the relationship on audio-based platforms releases us from that price per second transactional relationship that that we keep having with all other video channels, for example. So there's not that three to five seconds. And, and we all do that. And we all talk about that in other channels. But I think the lovely thing about audio is it allows real creativity. Consumers are open to listening to long stories, to elaborate stories from you on these channels, whether it's music streaming apps, with, whether it's now podcasts, if, if your business allows. So where's consumers? And then telling them stories that they want to hear. And I think this is the most important thing. As, as forgiving as audio, as audio storytelling is in terms of duration, but you also need to be giving them a story that's intuitive to the, to the, to the platform they're on. So if they're music streaming, you need to be as, as intuitive as, as is, whether it's a song or an integration or, or, or if, you, if you're in a podcast, it needs to be acceptable for your brand to be on the podcast. So it's consume. Where is consumers? So at PepsiCo, we do. Where is consumers? What are what are in the mood for at that point? And how do you tell a story that's believable, that's intuitive for you? And I know you said COVID. I think at Pep we've realized, or we've caught on the audio wave or wavelength uh, way before COVID hit, and and it's and it, which made it a lot easier for us to know what will work when COVID hit. Um, so that's how we did it um, in terms of connection mapping, connection planning, and what type of stories we tell on these platforms. Thank you so okay. much, Shatsi. It's interesting Thank that you so much. mentioned uh, where the consumers are, to be very honest. I just wanted to add a little bit uh, here on that. I think the audience at, at this moment in time, they are more aware than ever, uh, fortunately as well, because out of that, we get a lot of learnings ourselves as marketers and advertisers. Um, there's, there's always a need state for on-demand platforms right now that allows the um, the consumer to basically tell you what they want, what they want to consume, when do they want to consume that. So it's very interesting to know exactly when and where to target and where to speak to the audience uh, set there. So to answer your question really quickly, it's when our audience has told us that they are on such platforms. Um, the, the market is still, uh, if I may say, very young. Uh, right now in terms of identifying all of these different solutions we are able to provide. But the shift into where our consumers are right now is basically key. They are there on these platforms that require us to be as well, not just to cater for our business and just also to add any value into their lives. So I'll just keep it short at that because I think Chatia also covered a lot of uh, info there. That's yeah, that's um, very interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Talk. Can I can I respond to Ray uh, and Chatia? Ahead, because I think what's interesting is it's not only about where our consumers are, right? I think very much the rise of audio um, has been spearheading from this oversaturation of digital ads and video content, right? Like there is so much hitting us and we might be there, but we almost become numb to it. So I think this, this platform is so underrated because it is a storytelling platform. And I think, you know, to, to go back to what Shatsi said, instead of just gathering around a, a, a campfire listening to it, audio began, you know, when we started in the womb, you know, our eyes were shut, you know, our brains hadn't activated yet. The first thing that we experience and interact with is our, our mother's heartbeat. And then you grow up throughout this entire world, listening to sounds and interacting with communities and, and nature and, and even making sounds, right? So, for me, this, this platform is extremely intimate. It's extremely communal. So it's not, 
to answer the question of where do you start, I don't think we've ever stopped, right? You know, radio has been crucial because it is so impactful because it actually is one human being speaking to other human beings. And if you think about COVID, the, the rise of this, like, remember when the streets were absolutely silent, yet everyone was like flocking to their balconies to, to create an orchestra of music and, and singing to uplift an entire community that was really, really battling. Or people like leaning out of windows, banging pots and pans to congratulate health workers. It is an emotive platform that it's extremely connecting. And this is a reason why a lot of, I think it's 95% of people are actually saying that out of all the mediums, podcast is the most trustworthy because they are finding it the most authentic. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I think you, you put it beautifully. And uh, to your point, Claire, just to move on to the next question, when you were saying that audio is underrated, right, in terms of um, how, how it's being utilized. And this comes to the next question about, uh, about Work's uh, investment gap report. And it showed that audio consumption grew by 31% in the US, while audio advertising only uh, uh, address audio advertising spend uh, grew by only 8.8%. In MENA, audio is part of the mix, but hasn't really taken off in relation to the amount of time consumers spend consuming, uh, consuming audio, right? Um, so the question here is, as, as a client uh, or agencies, um, who have, act, who ha, who have act, as, as, as you guys who have activated, sorry, audio in the region, what advice would you give brands? Where would they start uh, and what would be the creative best, best practices? Um, Ray, if you wanna start with this one. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't mind at all. Um, it's, it's really interesting to, to come and approach this uh, from that angle because I don't think a lot of people manage to access that channel, that digital audio channel and advertising. I, as I said, I still feel that it's a little bit um, I don't want to use the word immature, but it's still a little bit young um, in, in our market. But we had had we had had the the opportunity to activate slightly a little bit and and get some learnings out of that. Um, what advice uh, we would give uh, in in and to be very very frank, stay very real to the to the consumer, stay very very real to the um, uh, to the platform itself. The platform itself is like any other platform. It is your Facebooks, your Instagrams. Whenever you have an adaptation of that campaign, it needs to come in with a real messaging uh, uh, approach to that platform. You don't want to come in and bore people with your uh, old school, um, um, uh, traditional laser sweeping in and choo -choo -choo, whatever. Um, here is our direct tactical messaging. It doesn't work when, when, you, when you approach such a, uh, a platform because people are going to go like, Okay, what the hell did I hear? You just bored me to death right now with your tactical messaging. If I'm listening to a podcast and if this gets interrupted by an ad or whatever, it needs to be very true. It needs to have that same emotional connection that the one-on-one -on -one panelist or um, uh, uh, broadcaster is basically doing. Um, it needs to be uh, very true as well to um, the, uh, the podcast itself um, as much as the platform that is on a podcast perspective. But yeah, stay very, very true to the platform. Do not take any of these tactical messaging and just slam them face first um, into the audience. They will not connect with you. They will fall short of your messaging. Have very sincere messaging um, that sets the platform as first and then your brand as second, or maybe the, the, the platform consumer and the messaging from the brand, um, just to keep it in a nutshell. Um, Claire, do you have anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. Look, my, my first point is just to start. I think, uh, you know, especially with where we are in the pandemic and everything, it's, it's um, you know, it's a reality that budgets are limited and stretched and, and done. And we so easily fall back into these visual platforms as our safety nets. But, um, you know, Saudi's got over 6 million listeners, you know, uh, UAE over 1.5. It, it, it can no longer just be an afterthought. And I think uh, what we normally do is, is always go back to strategy, because essentially, if we're talking about audio, the first step is one, 
where does it fit within your your wider you know ecosystem because we we always talk about omni-channel excellence and 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 how we make sure that our customer experience is absolutely seamless you know throughout all these different platforms yet we somehow always seem to go back and break it down platform by platform so my first step would be put it into your mix understand where it exists secondly from a creative perspective you need to translate your brand identity to an audio identity right figure out what you sound like what makes you memorable you know in the beginning of the the chat you played all these sounds it is something that is ingrained in you so figure out what that is and more importantly exactly what Shashi was talking about if you are going to meet your consumers where they are understand what they want to listen to where they're listening um you know what evokes that true emotion because only then can you package an amazing brief and go to DMS or Ngami, for example, and say, okay, here is my package. Here's what, you know, is what I want to achieve. Uh, help me understand what this looks like in an organic space. And then for example, if you already rehearsed in, in targeting programmatically, use programmatic and advertising to take from, you know, all these signals and understanding on, on where people are playing within this audio space and then bring them down the funnel. And I, I think one thing I'll just add on best practices, we are writing them as we speak for audio. So I think we're a generation that has, to a large extent, I mean generation as in anybody who's worked in marketing from the 80s till today, who's mastered video, right? Whether it's TV or online. I mean, we have slides and slides of scene by scene objectives of the brand in the first three seconds of, how to close an ad, how to throw your punchline. We are kind of writing the book right now with audio. So I'd absolutely. say absolutely embrace trial and error, right? You are in an environment that is extremely forgiving, right? Co-create a song with young artists, write the song, compose the song. It works amazing. You've just really, really, really created a very productive piece of content it doesn't move on. A lot of stars have been booed off stages and ended yep. up being yep. Justin Bieber. I mean, there's a lot. Uh, there's there's a lot of there's a lot out there, but just embrace the thought of trial and error. We've because video is extremely unforgiving because you commit thousands, if not millions, of dollars in both production and airing. You just cannot get it wrong. It's not the same on audio. So. This, the whole music supply chain and the whole audio supply chain is a lot more cost efficient, which allows you to do that. You, you get to learn, you get to know what works for your brand, what doesn't, because there's not that one size fits all, put your logo here, remove your logo there. It's quite, it's quite in, in, I mean, I've worked across on audio stories across different PepsiCo brands and it is far from one size fits all. I mean, what works for Pepsi in Saudi is completely different from what works for Quaker in Mina. So it is very individualistic, if you want to say it, or very bespoke, very tailored. So take the time, work with a very price forgiving channel and, and, and supply chain forgiving channel and, and learn what works for your brand. Yeah, and I think yep. what, what, what Shazi has to say here is extremely important, right? Because even video audio it is always evolving right and okay. actually trying to sequentially get that sound uh, and that message at the right time at the right place in the right mindset in the right channel um you know it's so easy from a theory perspective um but it it, it is so hard to crack practically and if, if you even think about for example airplanes right uh, or airlines rather um they have a different music, uh, musical journey or sonic journey from the time that you enter the plane, from the time that you leave the plane, from the time that you book your ticket, there is an entire journey that is built out purely just from an on-ground experience, right? And this will continue to evolve as much as we evolve. So yeah, 100% test and learn all the way, all the time. Absolutely. I think I think what, what you guys are saying in terms of you need a certain framework, but I think it's an experimental framework still. Um, to Shatsi's point, to sorry, to Claire, to your point is that there is a, not a step-by-step, -step, but maybe just like a, an approach that you can start 
on on uh, on uh, on working with audio. And to Shati's point, that you can actually experiment. You you have the luxury to experiment uh, on audio. And this, uh, I think, um, it's the same as the time of Facebook, right? So when Facebook started, or when social uh, as a as a or social media uh, as a business started in in 2010. It was still a very experimentational, and uh, you can you can uh, actually um, uh, go into social and test and learn before actually um, having this massive spend on 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 social at, at that time. I, I also think with the the rise of creators, essentially, right, storytellers. There's also an element of loss of control that you've actually just got to leave to these beautiful. Um, you know, people who are absolutely native to the platform know what they're doing. Um, and if they fit with your brand, let them create, because that is, is where true authenticity also comes through. It's not only down to the ads that we, we make. Um, and I very much uh, see a massive increase in terms of brand integrations, uh, brands leaning into actually creating stories with these storytellers that feel like you know, very, very close to you because the people that you end up listening to, like if, if you listen into podcasts, right? Um, uh, stats basically show that when you, when you love one podcast or one storyteller, right? You end up binging the entire thing. And this is the, the Netflix generation, right? We, we binge everything. But when, what happens when this happens is the storyteller on the other side uh, becomes so close to you, like a family member, like a friend, uh, which actually makes this platform trustworthy right because in the end again it's just about making sure that we get more human with our storytellers more quality uh, and closer to it using this medium yeah i just Absolutely. wanted to add something think, well. uh, go oh, ahead. Sorry, <laughs> sorry shanti i just wanted to add as well um with being in the right mindset on on digital um with regards to our audience and what they're really looking for um, audio has become so experiential at the moment in terms of storytelling and the way that we, we, we tell those stories. Um, at the moment, we have, and, and we've been seeing lots of stats into hardware um, uh, production that allows the end user to experience such audio um, uh, story, story, uh, stories or, or approaches, you know, yeah, such as, uh, just gonna say podcasts or um, experiential uh, audio. Um, we've seen so much stats on premium hardware devices being bought off the market like hotcakes, um, headphones um, that cost up to hundreds, hundreds uh, of dollars that are being picked up off the market like that. Look into all of, we are in a digital space. Look at into all of these audio, um, sorry, uh, analytics that comes back from these native platforms ask these native platforms, what kind of insights do you have? What's your biggest audio consumption and how is it being consumed uh, by, by the target audience? If you have 3D headphones that are being utilized across a different kind of uh, uh, mindset or audience segmentation, use that for your own space. Speak to the likes of, um, you know, the Dolby's and the, 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 there's so much you can do with content right now. It's, it's getting a bit silly how far <laughs> we're not um, behind that pace as well. So really pick up pick up your stuff and start running behind it. Yeah, and, nice. and just to Claire's point on, on allowing, because I think that's, when you say allow content creators and, and, and young performers to tell your brand story, I mean, as a brand ambassador, or as a brand marketeer, you kind of go like, oh my God, I'm going to relinquish control now. <laughs> I don't have 100% control over my brand story. It is a lot easier said than, than done. And I've been on both sides, so I, I kind of know how it feels on both sides. It is not easy, but once it, as you say, once it, it's right, it's perfect. It's actually, they know their platforms, they know what works. They actually live and breathe these platforms, so they know. And I just want to touch on a question in the chat that came in from Dana. If using influencers for audio is, is effective uh, or using visual influencers, to Claire's point, use the person who is intuitive to the platform. I mean, if it, I don't even think visual influencers are the same across the board. And we know very well an Instagrammer claims they have a Snapchat account, but in reality, they're re repurposing their Insta story on Snapchat. It's different. 
you're di- you're a different person. I mean, we keep saying Gen Z as a, a one brush that paints everyone, but in reality, it, it, it's completely different. I am a person on Enremi who is completely different than listening uh, uh, to a podcast on parenting, something I'm interested in, and then a completely different person when I'm on Snapchat. I mean, we're completely different. So, and so do content creators. The content creator who is creating for a podcast or who is creating for Enremi, who's a young artist, is not the same person as an Instagrammer. So I, I'd say follow their, their native platform. So yeah. just find yeah. them where, where they're most successful and stay there. I know it's much more cost efficient to go, let's have a contract that applies a couple of different channels. But in reality, it must, might be saving you on the cost of the influencer, but it's not as effective in, uh, of, of an outcome uh, uh, once you look at the outcome on the different platforms. Perfect. Yeah, and I think Thank you. The, Thank you. Killing Gibran's uh, timeline. Yeah, yeah, we have, we have, we have two so more questions. Much at it. We're killing we have Gibran's two more questions. Timeline. Go ahead, Gibran. We'll we have two more questions, to, uh, and we have, I think, eight, eight more minutes. Uh, so quickly, we're going to breeze through the next question. Uh, no. Just take a state, state your uh, your uh, your points uh, clearly, concise, because this is uh, like we talked about. This is ex- this is a rabbit hole question, right? It's all about yeah. um, it's all about uh, measurement. So so audio offers a very high level of engagement, and people can't close their ears off. And research has shown that audio listeners are are highly receptive. So the question here is that how has audio helped you in achieving your business goals and how did you measure it and how did you measure the impact of uh, of these uh, of these campaigns or, or uh, of, of audio Claire yeah sure okay I'll, I'll keep it uh, short sweet and concise but it's essentially it's always the golden question that, that goes back to how do I make sure ROI is measured and it goes back to what I was explaining about omni-channel excellence right um, if our consumers is absolutely everywhere uh, it, it means that looking at our measurement approach in isolation is not where we need to play right audio at the moment is extremely upper funnel focused yet we st- still do have solutions that bring us you know through through the full funnel but if i had to to have a black and white answer to say not a problem you just connect dot one to dot two um it's not going to happen and we are limited to uh the industry's ability to, to to create this measurement right so uh based on those limitations i would basically say your big focus is on reach um, and try not to get so, too involved in the media metrics like last clicks and 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 um, uh, all the other all the other metrics. You need to actually take a step back and look at the full funnel attribution um, and understand the wider impact that audio has within your 360 marketing mix. Because if you get that right, then you are truly doing omni-channel excellence, and then your measurements is is big picture, not a small media metric approach. That's super interesting, uh, Claire, for you to say that. Uh, Shatsi, as a brand, how would you see this? So I think return on investment has to start with the investment. So from a productivity standpoint, what the brand message you're landing um, through audio for, let's put a number to it, both in terms of production and distribution, at $100,000, you're landing the same one at a million dollars in video. So the investment threshold is completely different between audio and video if you compare them to each other, if they're even comparable. I'm not sure they're comparable, but if we are to do so. So from a productivity standpoint and and looking at, again, at shrinking budgets, et cetera, trying to land a long form message uh, in audio is a lot more productive. So the return is always uh, is always a multiple of that productivity, right? Because whatever you're saving in production and distribution, you're actually cre- creating a, a much better uh, multiple of return on that productivity, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Ray, uh, yeah. how do you see uh, it as, uh, as a creative uh, agency? Yeah. Um, I think even, even as uh, creatives or as an integrated resource here, what, how we look at things is, is very much different. I'm stuck in my chair, sorry. Um, so it's, it's more or less 
data driven. Everything that we do is based on insights. Everything uh, trickles down from honestly what the uh, what are we looking at uh, achieving out of our briefs. Um, very honest with you, I think that the ladies here said it very well. Um, don't look at data as you know your click through rates and all of that, and and how long and how well, all of that. But honestly, take that all of that data. You are on a digital platform. You are being serviced, a digital um, uh, service. You are being put in a space whereby we can definitely look at your behavior, study that, and not only take it and give it to media and say, hey, media, I need to target this because this guy didn't go really long. No, no, we have to take it and look at the psyche. We have to take it and look at the guy who, I'm just going to say, who didn't go through the full uh, uh, podcast or whatever it was, um, actually has a low uh, CTR or a header. We have to connect the dots in terms of trying to figure out what the, those audience are into, the psyche, the demo uh, versus the... Uh, uh, the uh, the cycle. So um, I'm not a cycle. Um, <laughs> Psyche. Context. No, absolutely. Context is key in looking yeah, at these yeah. metrics yeah. and in performance on audio because it's again not a one size fits all. Look absolutely. at the Excel sheet and 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 create algos for it. Okay. They're better so, media. This doesn't work like that. So I just wanted to just mention the last point is that. Um, when looking at all of these things, uh, data sciences with high emotional um, intelligence, a person with a high emotional intelligence on a data sciences table would definitely allow you a lot of insights. So measuring at the moment, as I, uh, I think spoke to you guys about this earlier, it is at a very big uh, a stage in time right now. And it's not because the uh, people like Angami and, and, and the rest of the on-demand uh, services. It's not. It's not their problem. The problem is with us as marketers and the brands not investing in such an industry that most probably will be the future for any um, uh, for for all of our strategies. So I'm gonna. I know you're. you're Thank you. That. Yeah. So I'm in. A, so this is the last question now. Uh, each one is gonna have one minute uh, just to just to close off in terms of the future. So today's world has become visually cluttered, and we all see this, right? I'll see this. Uh, of all of the challenges facing marketers today, attention scarcity is one of the most pressing issues and audio can cut through that clutter. So what do you think is the future of audio advertising? And what would you like to see happening more around the audio space? I think you touched upon it, uh, Ray, in the, in, uh, a bit in the head in terms of investment. Just what else would you see in terms of the future? One I minute each, please. Sorry, I'll, I'll go really quick. Um, so how I see it is that um, we have taken audio as a space where, where you know, the radio used to be involved in scripting, storytelling, and writing, um, moved it into the creative space, the, the more advanced the data analysis over the, uh, the creative briefs and, and, uh, and I, uh, the, the brand's uh, approaches. So what we have done basically is allowed more time into, sorry, more space into the creatives to tap into the audio. Um, it's, it's no longer a, a, a guitarist or a, a radio scripter that is basically telling you what you need to put on an audio uh, a space. It's basically your creative director and your ECD and your copywriter and your art director even tapping into all of this. So I see that there is a, honestly a very cool space um, that audio is going to lead into uh, in Thanks. terms of marketing. Thank you, Ray. Um, 30 seconds, Claire. On it. Okay, so for me, the, the future of audio always always boils down to uh, the future of technology and how consumers adapt to it, right? If we look at the US, we've got all these interactive uh, and interconnected devices. So we've got smart TVs, smart speakers, etc. And voice activated ads are, are slowly starting to come to, to, to the forefront. So for me, the future of audio is interactive ads. Um, so I, I, I should be able to voice activate it um, and it should always be within my interconnected devices. And I think that plus uh, the rise of branded content uh, in, in audio is going to be very much where we play. Thank you so much, Claire. And uh, Shatsi, uh, in terms of branded content, uh, you've been doing a lot on, on this. So how do you see the future of audio advertising? I think I'll summarize it. So it's channel specific content creation and production. Don't try to take your TV audio and repurpose it to an NRAB piece of content. It does not work. It will, consumers there are not listening 
to to hear your TV ad again on on that yeah. channel. And a huge shout out to the Enremi content team because they've really really redefined the uh, the creative space and they're super super helpful, super supportive and super intuitive. So listen to the listen to them, listen to the creative or the content teams in these platforms. They know their platforms just like you know your brand. Awesome. And uh, with that, like you, Shazi. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, our panelists again for their thoughts and uh, and the time that they put uh, today and uh, wish them and our audience uh, an amazing end of week. Um, have a great day and uh, hope we'll, we'll meet up soon, hopefully. Take care. Uh, Austin, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thanks a million for that. That was uh, that was brilliant. Um, that was, uh, yeah, absolutely fascinating. I could have got on listening to that for, and watching, obviously. I mean, other, you know, other senses do exist. Um, but uh, from, from Drew Brand's uh, uh, sort of dancing memory recall time machine at the start through, um, uh, through sort of raise lasers and focus on uh, <laughs> or the laser. I like the way the lasers of the past. And I know exactly the ads that you were talking about. Shoo, shoo, buy this now. Um, and then... Uh, it was really the Claire was talking about uh, sort of the the lack of how the spend is being left behind by the uptake, um, which went to um, yeah, sort of Shatsi saying that uh, I really liked what you said, Shatsi, about um, how the we're sort of writing best practice as we go along, and it's uh, what a great space to be in. It's um, I think you were saying it's much more cost effective, it, or in terms of we can. You know, we can really afford to experiment and uh, and have fun and um, you know sort of try things out. And if they fail, they fail. And if they work, they work. But what a sort of what a really exciting space. You know, this the stuff that you're putting out here, the stuff that we're going to be talking about in the next um, in the next session are sort of you know this is this is where best practice comes from. This is the sort of the conversations around it, and this is where the sort of learning comes from. So, yeah, watch, listen, and uh, learn from that. So, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm now going to be hosting the second panel, which we've called Cast Away. Do you see what we did? Um, and it's going to be, we focused on, um, so thank you so much, guys. We focused on a lot on, or uh, well, we looked a lot at podcasts in the first panel. This is going to be focusing specifically on, um, on podcasts. Uh, it's going to be looking at how brands can make the most of podcasts to market and promote themselves. And I'm going to be joined by two of the sort of two of the people who know podcasts best in the region. I'm going to be joined by Cheryl King, who's the marketing director of, uh, oh, sorry, marketing director, the managing director of Marketeers. Marketing director of managers, you know what I mean. Um, and uh, also by Leila Hamadi, who is the uh, co-founder and CEO of Finial Media. So uh, great to see you guys. And uh, uh, yeah, really good to see you and uh, and hopefully to hear you as well. So, um, so I'm going to... St- start off and I don't know it's always good to start with the basics and I don't know whether this is too basic but Cheryl stop me if this is a dumb question but what are podcasts I know everybody knows what podcasts are but do we know what podcasts are um, what are we talking about when we talk about podcasts hi Austin hi everyone excited to be here today and hey Layla as well nice to chat with in you fact, again so in fact, also Cheryl, could you tell us what Marketeers does? Because you're, I think to call your PR agency is to undersell your, um, your expertise in podcasts by an awful lot. So first of all, sort of give us the, you know, the elevator pitch for what Marketeers does and then tell us why we're, you know, what we're talking about when we talk about podcasts. No worries. Yeah. Well, oh, thank you. And yeah, I'm really excited for, for this session as well. And so glad that we're talking about podcasts. I think this is, is such a, a good community that's being built up by so many different people that works in the audio world over here. So yeah, d- delighted to be here. Um, a bit of background on um, marketeers. So we, we basically, we, are, we think audio first. Um, we are a, a, an agency uh, in essence, but we focus purely on the power of broadcast to reach different audiences via radio, via TV and online. Um, we started off in podcast, well, in audio, Um, some 28 years ago we were doing through from our office in London lots of dial-up interviews down the lines through different radio stations connecting brands to to speak to different stations around the UK and we we sort of became famous for delivering radio days um, which didn't really just do us justice in terms of what we did but it sort of set us on to our excitement about radio and that's why I think the, the synergies for podcasting works really well because it is essentially radio on demand 
Um, so since that sort of that, that sort of time period, uh, we basically evolved uh, as a broadcast consultancy. Um, and I, I think our excitement about the region and why we set up here is, is the opportunity to, to reach audiences in a different way. So forget your kind of uh, your print press release, obviously super important as well. Uh, and um, but as well, thinking on a kind of just wider sort of spectrum about how we can how people are evolving. You know, people are digesting content through so many different means, whether it's through print, whether it's through online, whether it's through radio, TV. I think that was our sort of excitement about coming to the, the Middle East. And um, I'm actually just working from um, Expo uh, at the moment where I've been here for since feels for years but it's been since um since the first <laughs> on over on, fr over on friday when we worked on the opening but it's been exciting to actually be amongst the thick of it connecting with brands and helping them with their broadcast content um so that's sort of the the marketeers piece um and i think our excitement was from an audio perspective podcasting i think is coming of age in region it's it's such a good time to be talking about that i think it's having a renaissance you know, podcasts are nothing new i think but it's taken a while I think for people to get their heads around them um, a little bit, you know, it's that sort of purple when, button that's on your iPhone. When well. you say a renaissance, there was that sort of, there was the serial time, wasn't there, about what, five, eight years ago, when podcasts sort of had their first renaissance. There was the birth of podcasts, then there was a sort of big resurgence, what would it be, five or so years ago, and what sort of brought them back? What's the sort of, yeah. you know, what, 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 why do, that sort of faded away and then now they really come back? Yeah, so. Serial was definitely a huge kind of turning point, I think, for um, for podcasts. And by that, I mean that the series at Serial that has reached, I think, millions of, of people that um, worldwide now. And that suddenly put podcasting front and foremost in terms of popular culture. And from then on in, it, it's really, it, it's now become a, a hugely kind of topical thing. I was just looking at the latest stats um, from the US. I think 60% of the population now listen to podcasts 60%. every month which is, is huge and in the region as well we are it's a fast kind of growing community and it is really sort of pushing the boundaries sort of forward but yeah i think in terms of the popularization of that it's this has been the perfect ecosystem over the last 18 months of podcasting you know people have been uh people have had more downtime you know people have found podcasts as this sort of new kind of more intimate way to connect with people in this age of disconnection and we've seen numbers rise i think it's just exciting to to actually um to be having this conversation and to talk about the opportunities for brands for which um, so, i think it's absolutely so Layla, what does finial do and um and where does finial fit into the sort of the regional global if you want podcasting landscape yeah, hi Austin, hi Cheryl. Um, so, uh, so Finial Media is effectively a podcast network. So uh, that means that we're content creators. We create audio stories. Um, so in-house, we focus predominantly on scripted shows and they're usually fictional, um, but we also do a lot of sort of more non-scripted content, whether it's for brands that want to have their own podcasts and, and own those and take them to market. Or uh, we also partner with a lot of um, independent podcasters who have their own ideas for shows and want to kind of get them off the ground and, and take those to market, we help them with that. Um, so, so we have a network of about 50 of our own shows in house, and then on top of that, we do sort of all the non-scripted uh, shows on the side. Excellent. Um, sorry, Cheryl, you, you mentioned earlier, you mentioned sort of some of the stats on 60% of Americans listen to podcasts in the uh, um, monthly. Um, I know that marketeers is, is probably you guys do some have done some original research into podcast in the in the region. Sort of what are the what's what does the regional market look like? And then Layla, I'll come back to you and sort of see what that means for the brands that you that you work with. You know, what sort yeah. of figures are we looking at? Absolutely. So so within the region, we did um and it. We did a, a bit of research to find out you know, how many people were listening because purely because there was no sort of real hard data and stats that actually outlined it before and it was definitely lacking and people brands were coming to us and saying really interested in getting involved but how many people listen and we you know we obviously didn't know so we i think we touched on this in the last the last the last uh, talk didn't yeah. we as people were saying yeah we don't you know it's hard to measure yeah and that's been a, a bit um it's been good to actually finally do some research to, to sort of canvas the the appetites we found um about sort of 16 or 16 percent listen uh regularly when we define that as regular listeners as what are listening every week to podcasts so 16 percent of people uh in the MENA region are listening at least uh once a week to a podcast so it may seem kind of low but this is sort of a bubbling community that that's fast kind of growing interaction i think the good thing the most important thing to note about podcasting is that it is quite it's very targeted audiences so 
everyone that listens to a podcast, they're not an accidental listener. You don't stumble upon a podcast by accident. You you seek it out by point of interest. So that's where I think there's a, a huge, it's quite exciting because every single person that's listening to that podcast has at least some type of interest in your subject matter. So you're speaking to a very specific audience. And that means we have a, a huge opportunity from, from a brand perspective to actually uh, communicate our messages in a very effective way. And yeah, so Leila, what does that mean for your for your network and also for your um, for the brands that you work with? What do they come to you for? You said that you um, produce some podcasts for uh, brands themselves, but you also um, sort of have other ones. So when brands are sort of when you're talking to brands and when brands are talking to you, what sort of attracts them to to podcasts? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a couple of things, right? And first of all, I'll say, you know, how grateful we are to marketers for having done this research because there is such a sort of lack of data in the market. So it's really helpful to have some stats on, on what's going on here. Um, but, the, you know, the, the sort of research aside, I think there's two things that are uh, really uh, sort of appealing and attractive about podcasts at this particular point in time. One of those is the pure uh, growth rates that we're seeing in the sector, which are almost unparalleled anywhere else. Um, and you know, you talked a little bit about the renaissance uh, or the resurgence of podcasts that we saw, um, you know, when Serial came out. But I would also say, you know, in the last 18 months or so since the pandemic, this has been an absolute game changer for the podcasting sector, right? Um, so if you look at, you know, the global stats around this space, we saw that in 2020 alone, there were 17,000 new podcasts coming into the market every single week. That's 17,000, um, like, <laughs> title, not podcasts, even episodes, actual... Titles, not even episodes, new podcast titles at a global level, right? This is, these are huge figures. Um, now, granted, there is a whole long tail of, of, of smaller shows there as well. I was there's going to say, there's going to be, that's going to be a lot of podcasts that one guy and his mom listen to. Yeah, yeah and, that's, and that's the key, right, is that some of them don't get scale or some of them, they're, they're not consistent with their output and so they sort of fall off the radar. But I think the key thing here is, you know, the, the boom that we're seeing now was partly driven by a lot of people, you know, when they had more time on their hands, realizing that they have these sort of passion projects that they've wanted to launch for a long time and, and now is the time to do it. Um, but what happened with this is the, the increase in supply also, you know, increased the demand a lot and the listenership went up uh, quite substantially as well. So, you know, in a year where, you know, the, the whole world is in absolute recession, uh, downloads on podcasts went up almost 200 percent. Um, and even revenues, you know, when every other every other aspect of the, the media sector was, was shrinking, uh, grew 20 uh, percent almost at a global level. In, in yeah. This... So, Oh, sorry, go on. Oh, it's okay. Uh, so, um, so I think one thing is is the growth that we have to look at. You know, it's it's clearly exploding right now, and 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 the reasons for that. And the second thing um, is, you know, it's even if the if the volume is 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 relatively small compared to platforms that have been around for longer in absolute terms, I'd say the levels of engagement that we see on these uh, on this kind of content is uh, again incredibly high and and almost unparalleled. So. Um, it, you know, as Cheryl said, it's very much an opt-in. It's a very much an opt-in medium, uh, and the people, the kind of people that host podcasts, have sort of amazing credibility. They build up real, really strong loyalty with their audiences. When people are really listening, they're really like not uh, consumed by anything else. You don't have the clutter of uh, uh, of sort of video and that kind of thing. Um, so there's no distraction really. Um, and so I think that's, that's part of the appeal for, for brands and that's where they, what they look to. And how do they, how do brands sort of get a, that's the appeal of podcasts in general, but what's about the sort of appeal of particular broadcast, uh, podcasts? Again, you sort of talked about there will be passion projects that, um, have very low listenership that may never get, um, sort of, that may never get the, the traffic. Um, that brands are looking for. Um, how do brands sort of start to select what podcasts they're going to be involved with? Because I'd imagine that they'll be they'll look for ones that reflect their values and things. But how do they know? How do they know which pod with seventeen thousand podcasts appearing? That's a lot of you know. <laughs> that's a lot of podcasts to look through. How do you even know where to where to start as a brand? How do you how do you decide what even what sort of podcast you want to be involved with? And that's before. And then we'll move on to I'll, I'll come back to um, to Cheryl to ask what are the sort of options. For getting involved so first of all what sort of podcast can you be involved with 
Yeah, so I think when assessing the landscape and looking at what types of content you can be involved in, like it's a little bit like looking at influencers in terms of macro and micro and, and all the other things that go along with it, right? So you can, it, it depends what your objective is and, and what you're trying to achieve as a brand. If the idea is I want as much reach as possible, then I want to go with sort of big hit entertainment series that are mass market driven and that are going to give me the, the, the maximum possible reach. But if the objective is to do something a lot more targeted, um, and podcast absolutely allows you to do that because there there are so many different genres, and you know, pick a topic that you're interested in, however niche it may be, there will be a podcast <laughs> out there about it. You know, I have people that are obsessed with woodwork uh, that I know who have found like really super amazing podcasts in the US that they're obsessed with. <laughs> Um, you know, the, I mean, the, the list is endless. So I think uh, it depends how targeted you want to be. Um, but there is, it's very easy to find podcasts that really fit your niche and fit a very specific uh, segment of the of the audience that you're looking to attract as a brand. Um, so Cheryl, you offer a sort of sort of wide consultancy to brands on all things audio. What um, if a brand comes to you and sort of with a blank look on their face and says, "I want to do podcasts"? What are their options? And that is often the start of the conversation. It is basically just that, that one line, we want to do a podcast, what do we do? Um, and that, that's, that's great to have an open brief like that is brilliant because then you can help kind of shape it and, and direct it. I do think as well, um, sometimes we, we sort of interrogate the reason why they want to get involved in the first place. You know, I think a lot of people default to produce as the first kind of de facto thing. And really they um when we sort of get involved from a, a podcast perspective we're looking at the whole kind of end-to-end -end piece so uh first of all who is your audience who are you looking to speak to because ultimately once we understand that and to, to Layla's point about the, the metrics for success is it that you're trying to you know looking at download streams is it you just want to mass awareness or are you doing trying to do something different are you trying to to shift perception uh, are you trying to move the dial or move the needle on, on something so you're getting people to think about your brand in a different way uh, we were actually working for a, a tech company on a big podcast series where we're trying to reposition them at the moment so their kind of metrics are very different to other brands where they're li literally looking for, for kind of to, to raise awareness of spokespeople what they're trying to do etc um, etc et so usually we just we go to kind of the start of pretend. So um, what are they trying to communicate? Um, who are you speaking to? Uh, what do you want to say? Then we can start thinking about the format and the presenter and what that content looks like. But also as well, it's really important from a, I think, a, to look at the end to end piece. I think there's some amazing podcasts out there, but they might have some great content, but if they don't really think about the distribution, the promotion, then you can have the best people in the world on it, but if you don't sort of tell people about it, then suddenly things start to fall down. So I suppose we, our sort of role really is also in the, the whole kind of ecosystem, but particularly with an emphasis on um, getting your strategy right and promoting that. Because I think every podcast episode is really a PR campaign. Like there's so much you can do with that one episode just to really work that asset hard um, across multiple ways. And yeah, I think um, from a branded perspective, there's often a massive rush to kind of jump on this sort of new shiny thing, but always trying to remember what you're trying to do, who you're trying to speak to, um, and what does success look like, then um, we can work on that and, whole piece. And how do you then sort of decide also, because I mean, that's sort of looking at brands creating their own podcasts, which again, uh, Finial does, but Finial, for example, I mean, I'm, I'm using this example because you're here, you also host, you also produce, I think, your own podcasts, am I right, that are non sort of brand, you know, not for brands, and you were saying that you'll take on sort of people producing their own podcasts. So there must be options there for um, for brands to come in as, I guess, everything from guests on the podcast to sponsors to adverts, um, you know, sort of where does, how does that conversation go? Um, because you've got sort of, I, I imagine that you've got from one extreme, which is the um, start your own podcast, which as Cheryl was hinting is more than just sitting in front of a microphone. You have to look at the marketing, you have to make sure that people listen to it, to going and buying an ad on a, on a sort of pre-made podcast, as it were, to all things in between. How do, and especially in the region, what sort of, where do people tend to, tend to sit on that? I'll go to... I'll go to Layla first, but um, feel free to uh, to come in as well, Cheryl. Uh, yes, exactly that. Um, uh, I mean, as you say, there's a whole range of options for brands when they when, when they want to sort of get involved in podcasting, and they range from you know the very the, the lightest touch option, which is to sort of just drop an ad in on an existing podcast, uh, through to you know sponsorships and more creative ways of integrating uh, podcast uh, integrating brands into um, you know, other existing podcasts. 
um, all the way through to, you know, the, the branded podcast that, that Cheryl was talking about, where, where companies are actually creating their own content. Um, so all, all the options are kind of available to brands, and they all serve quite different purposes, I'd say. Um, so depending, again, on what the, the brand is looking to do, then it, different things will be right for them, right? So advertising is advertising, and uh, uh, it's similar to what you'd get on, on other platforms, um, and can be all the way from sort of uh, very standard kind of programmatic, which is, you know, the, the, the company's own um, own ads that is, that is running on an automated basis, through to ads that, you know, the content creators will help you produce which tend to be a lot more effective because, um, you know, working hand in hand with the creator, you can actually produce something that is a lot more authentic, um, that is a lot more uh, sort of seamlessly integrated into the show. Uh, I think so the, last, the last panel touched on this quite a lot and said, right. again, it's uh, raise lasers. He said, don't just come in with a, an ad for cars or something with choo choo lasers, buy our latest thing. It's yeah, try and speak to the, yeah. to the actual audience that you've got. Exactly, yeah. and that works best once you have the, the host of the podcast themselves actually doing the read and, and helping with the, the scripting and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, and then there is, you know, there are things in between creating your own content and running an ad, which are, you know, the sort of sponsorship models. And this is where brands can um, get a lot more creative about how they, how they work with podcasters. So some of the things that we've done, for example, are, uh, you know, working with GMC on a scripted fictional drama series um, about two brothers on a road trip across Saudi Arabia, but integrating the, uh, the brand into the scripts uh, right from the very beginning of the development process, right? So in the same way that you get product integration on uh, Netflix series or yep. in Hollywood movies, exactly the same things can be done uh, in podcasts. It's just that I think the, the sort of automatic uh, go-to uh, thought for, for most brands when they consider podcasts is well if i want to do my own show then it has to be a talk show it's going to be an interview it's going to be a which is definitely one option but there's a whole host of other options in terms of formats and structures that can be that can be looked at as well that can be just as if not more engaging Cheryl, does that yeah does that match with your experience yeah sorry yeah i was just i was just gonna agree as well i think with seeing as well there's so there's so much i think that can be done with podcasting but it does feel like a bit of a, a minefield i think the sense we get from brands is that there is the interest there there's the, definitely the bravery to do um but also it's, it's it's about i guess the bravery to commit so we get a lot of briefs sort of, um from clients coming to us saying oh we just want to test the water maybe do one or two episodes um so then our sort of counsel really is um i mean it's definitely a longer term strategy but there's so much stuff you can do if you just want to sort of get involved as to this point you know it is just an add-on an existing podcast so you're using that podcast existing audience you can start to get some um, traction there as well but then they're kind of the more sort of committed and the ones that they're really taking it seriously there's sort of no end to what you can do i mean we're doing um some media partnerships at the moment with um for example we're working with business insider uh, and they're doing um, a piece actually with what, where one of our, our clients where they're kind of doing building in traffic drivers to existing podcasts as well. So that's quite exciting to see. It's oh, so that so that so the client is actually trying to drive traffic to the podcast themselves. So they're they're sort of so the podcast is marketing them and they're marketing the podcast. In yeah, a, in so a way. Very, exactly. So it's looking at it from that that one sort of solid piece of content and just looking at how can you get, get people as many people as possible driving them back to, to listen um, and then through the different various platforms so a lot of what we, we would do in the, the promotion is certainly social is a, a huge kind of piece as well but even looking at you know filming your, your podcast as well as, as audio so people think audio first but you know youtube for example is one of the fastest growing platforms to consume podcast content on you look at the likes of uh, joe rogan's podcast for example and how yep. people just consume content in different ways you know we're, we're talking now but we're doing this through through zoom you know people are, are looking for different ways to consume content and i think one of the positive things about um that the pandemic has been that podcasting can be done virtually as well so it's, it's super yes, easy you yes. don't always have to do it sort of sat down um, and that's i think it's been a big thing and but it's been one of the uh, the winners i think in terms of comms throughout the the last 18 months you know we've seen so many events 
get cancelled. Um, but one thing that I think has been really, really good to see is the fact that podcasting, I think, has been fueled in part by the fact it's so easy to do from a kind of audio perspective and uh, through sort of um, virtual platforms. And obviously the audio needs to be great. Um, I think the podcasts are a lot more sophisticated now than, than they used to be. You know, people are investing a lot more to make sure that everything's great. But um, yeah, virtual has been useful. Now you said that the sort of, obviously you said that you want brands should see podcasts as a as a long-term thing, as a, you can't, it, it presumably doesn't make much sense to make a sort of one-off podcast because it'll be tough to get people to listen to it. But um, in terms of the commitment, where, sort of what is the commitment? Is it, I guess it's as much time as, as anything else because I mean, uh, I think the last panel touched on the sort of cost effectiveness of, of audio. And I'd imagine that if you're making, um, I'd thought that some of Layla's products, the sort of the big budget, um, sort of, you know, full audio, sort of, I don't know, almost cinematic audio, would that almost be the thing of sort of the stories of the brothers traveling across Saudi Arabia and things, that's going to be expensive to do. But um, I know that radio ads have long been, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can purchase radio space and you can produce radio ads quite affordably. And I'd imagine it's much the same with with podcasts is it is there much of a price barrier there or is is the barrier mainly time and i don't know sort of commitment in terms of <laughs> and other terms yeah yeah i think it, it's it's all of all of that and i think it depends on um this because there is a lot you can do it it depends on where you sort of put the focus but but definitely um it's the consistency of the episodes i mean we typically would do on a, a 10 part podcast series so you're kind of getting the, the momentum going you're building a community and a lot of the time you're building that from ground zero up so you're really kind of starting from from the bottom um, and then to support that as well we would we create your social media campaign as well as the the content piece but yes i think you know there is a time commitment certainly from the hosts um, as well and, and the team kind of getting involved but i like the fact i like podcasts uh, always because it's that authenticity of, of the conversation it's not meant to be if it is a sort of a, a kind of Q and A sort of style piece, it's not meant to be sort of overly kind of um, edited. It's meant to seem very natural, very organic. So I think the barriers to entry are a lot lower than doing something like video, um, where you know you might have ten rounds of changes because everyone needs to sign off that piece mm -hmm. of content. You know, the powerful thing about podcasts, and that's one of the reasons why they're they're a real sort of trusted medium. Uh, I think the sort of it. it consistently tops the polls in terms of being um, the most kind of engaging, most trusted piece, uh, a way to consume content is because of the fact that is that trusted sort of voice, you know, you've got that intimate connection between the presenter um, and the audience as well. They're talking about a subject they feel passionate in and it's very, and it's, it doesn't feel overly edited. So you, that's when I think you, you really kind of trust what that presenter says. And then that's why you engage more and they can be quite powerful. Layla. How do you? How does a regional network like like Finial compete with international networks? Um, it seems and international podcasts because again we've spoken about you know we've touched on things like the Joe Rogan Show, which I think was just sold to was it a hundred million dollars that uh, um, that Spotify bought it for, and we had Serial that's reached millions and millions of people and. Um, Obviously, these are big American shows, which means they have big American budgets. And there's, um, how do we, how on earth do we in the region compete with that? How can you produce a podcast here that will, and especially now you've got uh, programmatic buying coming in, so that um, regional ads can appear on the Joe, the Joe Rogan show. You know, how do you, how do how do you compete with that? What sort of what what's the uniqueness there? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, look, it's 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 pretty similar to what you see in the world of TV or, or any other form of media, right? So you have the demand for Hollywood content and for stuff that's coming from, uh, you know, the West, but you also have huge demand for local Arabic content. Uh, I mean, that's just the nature of the audience that we have here in the MENA region, right? So. Um, yes, the, you know, there are a few podcasts that at a global level do really, really well, including here in the region. So BBC News always does well, mm -hmm. uh, TED Talks always does well. But honestly, if you look at the top 10 podcasts in, uh, in, in the biggest markets here in the region, they are nine times out of 10 in Arabic and they're local. <laughs> They've been locally produced because, you know, it's, it's the same in any other form of media. The, the studies I've seen say that at least 70% of, of uh, Khadijis here in the GCC 
tend to want to see more entertainment that's based on their own history and based on their own culture and that feels representative of them and that represents them and their families and their friends and, and feels authentic. And while the quality of content that we get from the West is, uh, is very high and there is certainly uh, space for that, there is at the same time definitely huge demand, if not more demand, for, uh, for localized content as well. So, well, it seems um, that it seems that there's you and there's a couple, there are a couple of other sort of b b g growing regional podcast networks that are sort of uh, definitely sort of coming out of that Arabic content for, and that and that seems to be a massive sort of growth market. Unless I'm I'm wrong, like you said, there's because, but yeah, because like you say, Khaliji's don't there isn't a yeah, the, 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 Joe Rogan doesn't speak Arabic, um, so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, was it's, just gonna... it's also culture, right? And it's also yeah. that it, that authenticity is really important. Um, yeah. uh, it's the same on YouTube. It's the same on uh, you know all these platforms. I think people want want content that actually speaks to them. And so I think that's where the you know that's where the huge yeah. process is on at the moment. Cheryl, you're about to. Yeah, no, I was agreeing. Yeah, it, I definitely think we see the, the, the huge kind of focus on local content produced from the region, for the region, by the region. Like that's been a, a, a big sort of piece. And I think that that is, you know, it speaks to people to, to lay this point. It, it, people with the same values, the same cultural nuances. It, it's, and that's the good thing um, because it is very, it's so targeted and very local. You know, people want to hear from people from the region. And we, we've sort of seen the rise in Arabic contact um, podcasts as well. I think there's um, something around like a third of pod, all podcasts from the region are produced in Arabic now. And that's so it's like, that's really interesting to, to see. So it's not that I think that the Western sort of podcasts are, are sort of been sort of rejected in favor of local. It's more like they're existing side by side. And But even what we saw even um, when we did some research um, on the Saudi podcast market um, during the pandemic, it was during April, 2020, when we were sort of in the thick of it, but we saw huge kind of numbers of people consuming localized uh, Arabic content. I think we found that one in four women actually listen to in Saudi listen to podcasts at least once once a week as well. And the types of podcasts they're listening to were everything from comedy to entertainment to, to lifestyle. So it just sort of showed this sort of big swell. And you know, Arabic was the was what they were looking to listen to. And what are the is Saudi the biggest market then, or is or is it mainly the biggest market for spend? What about places like Egypt and sort of other other Arabic speaking countries? Do, do yeah, yeah, so we see, yeah, we see a lot of it. I mean, yeah, UAE, Saudi, Egypt, you know, huge kind of markets for for podcasting as well, and the rest are sort of uh, fast coming up as well. But uh, yeah, it's a big kind of. I think the, those sort of markets as well there's so much content coming out of that. And that's, I think, where we're seeing so many different content creators coming from there as well. Um, and, and from a brand perspective, we're, we're also seeing, I think we see a lot of the, the clients that come to us want to use podcasts as a vehicle to to speak to people, not just in the Middle East, but we're, we're doing a lot in, in Africa as well. And that just being another way to kind of consume, to reach different audiences via as something that's so simple, you know, everyone has their smartphone. So it's such a simple way, an effective way to, to listen to content. And that's why I think the appeal is so broad, um, no matter what, what country you're in. Do you get much, do you get many listeners, Layla, outside the region um, to your to your podcasts? So because uh, I'm thinking there's also things like the sort of the the sort of diaspora of people from here. I know that uh, Angami, for example, who we had on the last uh, panel, I know that they've said that they that a lot of their listenership comes from Arabs living abroad because they have a very good thing, uh, a very good sort of uh, library of Arabic music. Do you get many listeners outside the region? We get some, but I'd say it's a minority. Uh, okay. I mean, our focus is definitely here on the MENA region. And again, yeah. it mirrors the, 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 the same, you know, top three markets that, that most people would, would assume. So it's, it's yeah. Saudi, Hawaii and Egypt. <laughs> That's where most of the listeners are. <laughs> And what sort of, for companies like yours, is, um, does most of your, um, your revenue come from, from the, the advertisers that you have and things? Or are people, because I know that I've heard of sort of, there's been investments in podcasting groups and things. Do, you know, who, and if there is, who's, who's investing in it and what are they sort of, what are they looking at? You know, I'm, I'm thinking sort of big, big commerce and things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, there's been, there have been, there's been a, a big increase in sort of M&A activity around the yeah. podcast sector in the last, uh, in the last 12 months. Um, and there is a lot of investment going into this space. Um, but I mean, in terms of monetization for, for podcast networks, you know, advertising is one uh, piece of the puzzle, I guess, but there are, there are others as well. So advertising sponsorship is one thing. Uh, the branded shows that we talked about is another. 
Um, we also, you know, because we're creating a whole sort of library of, um, uh, of strong IP, we also able to license that out to platforms that want to have uh, uh, exclusive content or a window of exclusive content um, or, you know, very similar to the sort of TV model again. Okay, that's <laughs> it. Um, and then, uh, you know, distributing it on, on many different types of platforms, whether it's airlines or, you um, uh, you know, content platforms, uh, you know, the, the, the options are endless. Um, and then now there's subscriptions as well. So uh, this is a, a relatively new phenomenon in the in the podcasting sector um, where uh, creators are able to monetize through subscriptions without building their own uh, direct to consumer app because they have the option to create a channel under the umbrella of um, Apple. Oh, that's is, something that's working very well. Is it going to take off? Do you think? Do you think it's going to do you think it'll work? Yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, already that, you know, we only, only launched, uh, so I'm talking weeks, not months, um, but the traction already is, is very strong. Um, and there is appetite for, it depends on the type of content, I think, um, but anything where there is a hook for listeners, where you're, you're sort of keeping some content away from them and it's, it's kept behind a paywall and there's a good reason for them to go over and subscribe, uh, then, um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, the traction is really good. <laughs> It speaks volumes about the the quality of the content as well, doesn't it? When people, uh, it's it's really nice when people are prepared to pay good money to to listen to your content. You think, yes, I'm definitely doing something, <laughs> something right. As a journalist, I know this. <laughs> um, so we're coming sort of towards the end, but uh, I want to normally I ask uh, for a, sort of a couple of sort of final questions, but or sort of one final question, but I've actually got a sort of couple. And first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to come back just to give you a heads up. I'm going to ask you about what your favorite podcast is that you're involved in and what your favorite podcast is that everybody should be listening to you that you're not involved in. Um, so I'll come back and ask you that. But first of all, let's, this is focusing on what, you know, on how brands can use podcasts. So I'm going to ask both of you for your advice on three things first, which is how can brands decide whether podcasts are right for them how can they decide how to get involved in terms of sponsorship, being a guest, uh, branded podcast, um, all the other options there? And then how can they sort of make the most of their um, of that involvement? How can they sort of leverage their, their podcasting? And so um, I'll come to you first, Cheryl, if I may, put you on the spot. So first all of all, right. how, again, we sort of touched on this earlier. How do you decide if a podcast is, is, a, is a sensible thing for your brand? Yeah, I think first of all, you, you just you need to figure out, you know, what, what is it you want to say and who are you speaking to? So once you know that, then you can figure out, right, is the podcasting audiences, how do you reach them? Um, and that, is that the right way for you? So I, I think basically it's, it's not even thinking about podcast first, it's what is the message that you want to communicate? Then you you see whether that's a, that aligns itself to, to figuring to doing a podcast or should it be that you just get involved on a lower level or it, should you commit to a whole series? Um, this because I think podcasts are very narrow cast and you can be so targeted with who you're speaking to. As long as you're very clear on the audiences you can get, you can you want to engage with, then a podcast is a real natural strategy to to, to look at. I think that the thing is that brands should just think about is that it's being brave, not just in the opportunity to deliver a podcast, but committing to it in terms of the entirety. You know, the most successful podcasts are ones that look at everything. You know, they're not they just focus on that one piece, which is the the piece that everyone thinks about first, which is just producing the content. So you think about the whole ecosystem. There's some great, I think social media is a huge, hugely powerful piece to, to think about it's in terms of supporting that, using your guests, using your, your advocates, thinking about op-ed pieces you can do through AI software, like thinking about YouTube strategy as well. It's all very simple stuff, but very effective when done right. Um, so yeah, that was, I think, I think Excellent. definitely they should. That's, that's very good. And, uh... Yeah, I think commitment sort of is commitment and diversity is that all sort of commitment and, and magnifying it beyond the podcast itself. It seems sort of key to it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And I was and, just going to uh, add as Oh, yes, please. Sorry, I was just going to add as, as well, just like when you have your, your podcast piece, again, I think it's there's so much you can do with that from a, a comms perspective. So it's, it's think, seeing it as a kind of an each an individual PR campaign per episode and when you deliver your podcast series as well, it's not just you know, thinking of it very linear. Um, so, you know, you go to episode one, two and three and four and, and so forth. But you can always journey back to episode two, for example, if there's a piece around 
I don't know, women's empowerment and you've got um, International Women's Day coming up, then there's a piece you can do to promote that. So I think it's just thinking of it as in its Espe it's Especially presumably as the as your traction builds. You were talking about building from the ground up, which means that your first few episodes are going to get not nearly as much reach as your as your later ones. So you do you think it's sort of worth call, you know, sort of calling people back, going as we spoke about in episode you know, in episode two, you can go back and listen to that and then yeah, sort of re magnifying yeah. it. Definitely, definitely. Because then in that case, then you, you're kind of continually re revisiting and, you know, think about the podcast that, that you listen to. Like, I'm always looking at uh, the, my favourite ones and I'll go back and listen to, you know, episode, I don't know, two of something or other that Jay Shetty's <laughs> talked about. And then it'll go back to another one that is inspiring me. So it's just thinking about the different ways that, that what kind of resonates. So, yeah, I don't think people, audience is always just consume in a very chronological order. They'll always go back, which means from a comms perspective, it always opts to um, opportunities to keep um, working them hard so over to uh, over to Layla then and uh, how do you decide if, if podcasts are right for a brand and once you've decided that how how do you decide how to get involved as a brand what would your advice be yeah, and so then well, yeah and then mean, how do you make the most of it <laughs> sure sure so uh, honestly I think a really good place to start if you if you haven't considered it before and if you're not yet an avid podcast listener yourself is actually just to start listening um, because honestly, as a as a brand uh, looking to see what other brands have done in other markets is a is a really good indicator of the number and range of creative solutions that there are out there. Because um, chances are, whatever sector it is that you're or that you're working in, whatever industry it is, someone will have created a podcast around that, um, or they'll be you know using creative solutions in terms of advertising other podcasts that exist out there. Um, and, and it's a really good way to sort of get into the ecosystem, get used to it, see what the options are, see what you like and don't like about, you know, the different ways that, that the brands are sort of collaborating with podcasters. And that's a sort of good, I think, starting point to get you into the system. And then once you've kind of decided that, you know, podcasts are a good way to go and you can see, you start to, you know, visualize and envision what that could look like for you. I think, you know, as you said, you know, the, the, the simplest thing to do is be a guest on a, a on, on another podcast, and that's really, um, you know, sort of more of a, a PR tool, I'd say. Um, and then the other involvements really depend on on what it, it is that you're looking to do. So if it's more about sort of brand awareness or, or kind of positive brand association, then sponsorships can be a great option. But if it's more about, you know, you've got a story to tell uh, and you want to deliver long form messaging and you believe you can uh, uh, build a really strong kind of narrative thread around that, then, um, you know, why not produce your own podcast or, or find someone to help you with that? I mean, I think, um, you know, that that works very well for, for many, many brands all over the world. So that's and, <laughs> and what are the best? OK, and so let's say you've decided to make your own podcast. This is, you know, your specialism. What are the yeah. How do you make the most of that? What are the mistakes that you what are the mistakes that you would warn brands um, against making if they're making their own podcast? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can you can go straight in there yeah <laughs> go ahead Cheryl I, I was basically just um, I mean I was going to say on the audio piece um, that's something I think people just sometimes take for granted um, we uh, absolutely having your know, the audio right is is critical um, making sure you've got a, a good microphone um, you're in a quiet room you know that the cat's not going to start you were doing it virtually you're not going to have anyone disturb you you know that that's important and uh, especially when you're working with you know senior stakeholders in um, on different brands when they're coming in they just want to press the go and sort of do their piece um, if they're doing it virtually you know making sure that you've kind of done a line test beforehand I think uh, is important um, that's on the on the production side but um but yeah I think just other you know things just to, to, to watch out is it, just making sure it's um just a, it need to be a well thought through process you know you need an engaging host you know you need something great to say you know you need to have a, a piece you know what happens after it's edited you know there needs to be a clear understanding of what success looks like because once you know that then you can devise your, your strategy accordingly. You know, if it's mass awareness, you'll approach it very differently to if you're trying to get someone to do something or think a different way. So once you've kind of got those metrics in place, and I think, yeah, you're, you're good to go. But um, yeah, I'm sure Leila's yeah. got some yeah. other thoughts. Absolutely. Leila, what would you add to that? Yeah, I mean, there's so many things, but I think probably the key one would for me would be consistency. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very easy to decide you want to do a podcast 
and very and, and much harder to uh, make sure that you continue with it and keep up the momentum and you're consistent with the uh, episode output so that listeners know exactly when they can expect content from you, uh, what you're delivering them, um, so that you can sort of maintain the, building up the momentum and, and keep growing the audience. So that's, uh, that's one of the key pitfalls. Excellent. Right. Final, as I say, final t- two questions. I'm going to wrap them into one. What, so Layla first, what's, what podcast are you involved with? Are you guys producing that everybody should go and listen to? And what podcast do you wish that you'd been involved with that everyone, what are you listening to from somewhere else? So what are your, yeah. one, one of yours, and one of somebody else's? Okay, so ours, I would say The Code, which is uh, the first, the region's first sci-fi series uh, in Arabic. And it's around four Saudi gamers who get lost in their online world of, of games. And it's how, really many, how many episodes are we talking? Uh, it's eight episodes this season. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and one that I'm not involved with, but I wish I had been. So uh, I love all Wanderings shows. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but yep. they're it's such awesome content. And uh, season three of Dr. Death just came out. It's true crime. And it's even better than the first two seasons. I didn't even know that was possible. So. Excellent. Cheryl, what are, what are you involved with at the moment? And uh, go and give us one that you're involved with and one that you wish you'd been involved with. Yeah, well, one, one I, we're involved with, which I love, um, it's actually, uh, it's, it's a true crime piece actually to Layla's point about that. And these are one of the a huge popular genre for podcasting. Uh, it's called The Case Files and it's by um, a legal brand called um, Slater and Gordon. And basically it's um, true, true crime stories and um, guests are talking about the different crimes that happen. And then it's the kind of legal standpoint that happens at the back of it. So it's like how they would have advised or what they would have done differently. So it, a- it's just well put together. I think it's great. Is that out of this region or out of your London office or? It's out of, um, it's an international piece, um, but it, it's an Ooh. interesting one. And I think, yeah, from um, once we've done over here, um, I think Mabadal is doing some really interesting stuff. We're, we're working with them on a series called Mabadal Trends. Um, and it's all around, it's with, um, it's a very localized podcast and it's got a really kind of cool, engaging host. And it's just tackling some of the biggest kind of business issues and decisions and challenges that the region has and just looking at the opportunities for, for growth. So quite a business focused podcast, but yeah, really nicely put together. And um, it's great to, to see a brand like Mabadla, um really kind of pushing forward the podcast piece. Okay. Um, and one that you're not in, one that you're not involved with, what are you listening to at the moment? Uh, I've got a slightly cringy uh, podcast I am, but probably one I, I love at the moment is um, I listen to a lot of Jay Shetty's podcasts and I mm-hmm. love what he talks about. Uh, I think he's really engaging and he's built up his brand really well through his audio piece. Um, but I love as well um, Desert Island Discs. I'm having a oh, bit of a renaissance uh, on that at the moment, but really good one. And that's a classic one where you can go back. You can That's not entirely non-linear. You can listen to yeah. any any age of them. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, both of you. That's all we've got time for. Um, and uh, I wish we could go on for ages, but um, you're, you guys are both easy to find on, uh, on uh, social and obviously in, uh, <laughs> in various pod- appearing on podcasts around the, the region. Um, so thank you very much to Cheryl King, Managing Director of Marketeers. And thank you to Leila Hamadi, who is the co-founder and CEO of Finial Media. Um, that was, uh, yeah, thanks a lot, guys. That was uh, absolutely brilliant. Thanks to all our panelists, in fact, and um, thanks to our sponsors, DMS and Angami. I will remind you, for those of you who might possibly have forgotten, um, which I'm sure you haven't, uh, that Angami is the leading music streaming platform in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and as you've heard, uh, they also do a lot of other things besides great music production and things. Um, they've got a library of more than 70 million Arabic and international songs, um, and they provide users with a collection of podcasts, including Campaign on the Record with Campaign Middle East from all categories and ready-made playlists curated by a team of music experts. DMS is the digital arm of Shwerdi Group. Uh, it's the voice of independent publishers in the, media, the MENA region, uh, represents more than 30 Arabic and international websites, music, video, music streaming platforms, including Angami. You can see it all fits together. Um, and they work hand in hand with brands and independent publishers to uh, deliver tailor-made digital solutions backed by data-driven insights. Uh, so as I say, that's all from, uh, from that. And uh, thanks again to all our speakers. Uh, it was really interesting listening to you. and. Uh, You can find out more about all that we've discussed and you can find new writing by and about 
the panelists um, in Campaign Middle East on campaignme.com, on in our newsletters, do sign up to those on the website, on our social channels, on our podcasts, uh, and through webinars like this. Also, uh, remember to get in touch for our digital essays if you want to be involved with that. They're coming up soon. Watch out for our Out of Home Guide coming out at the end of the month. Sign up for Marcoms on our website and keep an eye out for details on our Out of Home Breakfast Briefing, which is uh, coming up. So thank you everyone for attending. As always, thanks for making up our community and uh, really looking forward to seeing some of you in, in person for the first time in a long time at some of our upcoming events. Uh, I've been Austin Allison, the editor of Campaign Middle East. Till next time, stay safe and goodbye.